reading of Maggie, chapter 13. Around mid-March, the halls at the school filled with the glorious smell of rubber cement, the sharp sound of scissors cutting construction paper, and the wonderful buzz of facts questioned over and over again. It was time for the science fair, and it wasn't just any science fair. This was the science fair I would be defending my blue ribbon. The year before, I had won top prize for an amazing, no holds barred expose on rainforest destruction. I'd written an extensive report filled with facts and interesting interviews from local tree hugging hippies. And for my big ta da, I hadn't done one of those typical, super boring three panel boards everyone else had done. With mom's help, I'd stapled together over a hundred giant sheets of bulletin board paper and rolled them out across the gym floor. Each paper represented 100 square miles of rainforest destroyed. It had been a precise dramatization of the crazy amount of rainforest that was chopped down every hour, and it had clinched my victory. I'd walked away with my head held high triumphantly, and I'd gotten every picture in the paper, which was fun, but ironic, because the local paper is probably printed on paper made from rainforests. Anyway, I'd won. I'd gotten a blue ribbon, and I was going back for another. Mom and Dad knew the science fair meant a lot to me, and they did whatever they could to help. Mom excused me from my chores for a couple of weeks so I could immerse myself in research and Werther's Originals, a butterscotch candy that makes you smarter, wiser. <clears throat> and Dad helped me comb through National Geographic's, even the scary ones with naked tribal people. And their help made Tiffany furious because she had to do her chores and mine for a few weeks, but whatever. I was trying to change the world. The only thing she ever changed was boyfriends. I usually announced my science fair topics in a big to-do at dinner. Dad would drum roll his fingers on the table and when he stopped, I'd announce my topic. And Mom and Dad would ooh and ah because they're my number one fans. And you need your number one fans when you're doing big deal stuff. But this year, I was keeping my topic a secret. A top secret to be revealed when I was too far into research for my parents to make me choose another topic, which I knew they would do as soon as they find out. I hadn't picked just any of the world's problems to research. I'd chosen a problem that lived in our own home. This year, I was chewing, doing my project on Dad. I was going to get one step closer to fixing him. When Mom and Tiffany dropped me off at the library, Mom begged me to tell her what I was doing. Come on, Maggie, a hint. I rubbed my hands together like a mad scientist. In due time, lady, in due time. Tiffany rolled her eyes. You're such a weirdo. Mom gave her a mom look. Knock it off, Maggie. We'll be back after we get your sister a pair of jeans. Okay. I reached for my backpack from the back seat and gave Tiffany my most brilliant smile. Hey, Tiffany, you know what else you should get at the mall? What? A new face. Slam. Mom drove away and I high five I high fived myself for ending on such a zinger. I opened the library door and the smell of knowledge and dust hit me in the face. I loved everything about the library. I loved the rows and rows of books. I loved the cranky old ladies who read about knitting while knitting. I loved the book alarm that caught book thieves. I loved that while technology progressed, I could still depend on books because no one ever lied in books. And I loved that the librarian loved books just as much as I did. And she brought me juice boxes and pretzels when I was studying, and I enjoyed them even though you're never supposed to eat or drink in the library, but she was in charge. And well, the pretzels were sourdough, and the juice box was crayon apple, my favorites. I set up the research lab at my preferred table next to the A to F American History Row. It was the only table in the whole place that didn't wobble, and today was mine, all mine. I spread out my pencils and my paper and my color-coded index cards, pink for encyclopedia facts, blue for other reference books facts, and yellow for random thoughts along the way. I started with the basics, the elusive M encyclopedia. I began at the end and found what I was looking for between Morpheus, the Greek god of dreams, and Mumbai, which is in India, where cows walk around in the streets like their people. I had never seen all 17 letters of dad's disease in print before. Multiple sclerosis. They looked like a big deal. I sounded the words out phonetically under my breath so I could understand them fully. 
Each letter carried a different weight of its own. The M wasn't warm and cozy like a muffin. It was cold and distant like Mars. And the S curved like a snake, but instead of scales, I imagine it was made up of thousands of pins and needles, like the ones that pricked and pinched Dad's hands and feet from the inside out. All 17 letters together felt heavy. Heavier than an elephant, heavier than a whale shark, heavier than the biggest meteor in all the universe. It was a heaviness that metaphorically weighed me down from head to toe. I pushed the encyclopedia away, not wanting the letters to touch me. For the first time, I was scared of catching Dad's disease because right then I realized I didn't know as much about his disease as I thought. In fact, according to the facts, I hardly knew anything. It was time to pull up my bootstraps. I filled my pink purple cards with one new something after another. Dad's disease was an anti-inflammatory disease in which the fatty myelin sheaths around the axons of the brain and spinal cord are damaged, leading to demyelin demyelinization and scarring, as well as a broad spectrum of signs and symptoms. I didn't know what any of that meant, but it sounded serious. Next, I moved on to the symptoms. There were so many, I decided to highlight the ones Dad had. Symptoms included tingling, rickling, or numbness in the extremities, muscle weakness or difficulty movement, moving, difficulties with coordination and balance, problems in speech or swallowing, visual problems, fatigue, loss of bladder control, cognitive impairment, intermittent tremors, sensitivity to heat, unstable mood, he kind of had this, but only when nothing good was on the radio, so I didn't highlight it, Desperate depression, and paralysis either partial or complete. I had seen all of these words before, but never all in one place, and never specifically related to Dad. My eyes leapt ahead of my brain. I was reading things I didn't understand. I had goosebumps everywhere you get goosebumps. There was no clear cause. It wasn't a cold. It wasn't something you could catch. The medicines had long names, and no one knew if they really worked. Why would anyone invent medicine that didn't work? The disease evolved over decades, and there were two types of it. One kind went away and came back. Another type never went away and only got worse. There were varying degrees of severity with both. Then I read the last thing in the last paragraph of the entry. There was no known cure. There was no known cure. A big lump formed in my throat. My eyes filled with water, but it wasn't tears. It was sweat from my brain working double time. I closed my eyes and let the brain sweat roll down my face. My brain was learning things my heart didn't want to know, and it was making me mad. How could my parents keep all this from me? Did they even know that I now knew? Unlikely, since I never saw them do any research. And how could these scientists and doctors be perfectly okay with calling things unknown or inconclusive? They needed to get with it, do their jobs, put on their goggles, and not take them off until they put together all the pieces of the puzzle. Maybe start with the corner pieces and then work in toward the middle. And if they were missing a piece, they should look under the couch. As soon as I was exhausted my mad at them, I got even more mad at myself. Why had I never thought about all this before? I mean, I spent so much time with dad and most of the time his arms and legs were asleep, but I never really thought of waking them up. I looked down at my hands. They looked just like they were like his. We even had the same palm lines and knuckle creases, but mine were awake and his were falling asleep. Maybe forever. Why was I just now realizing all of this? Actually, I kind of assumed before that the sleepiness was caused by doing the bad sort of things that I knew dad had done, like not doing his homework and dropping out of college and dodging the draft and lying to neighbors by telling them it was Tiffany blasting loud music. I thought it was the kind of punishment that he would eventually pay off. His timeout would end. He would eventually come out of the corner and out of the chair and do good deeds for the rest of his life, like save kittens from trees and bald eagles from extinction, and we would live happily ever after in a treehouse like the Swiss Family Robinson, where I could get my own bamboo room and we would look back on the days when his arms and legs were asleep and say, whew, glad that's over. But now I knew it would never be over. Now I knew there was no way to fix dad. 
and when I thought, that almost made me choke on my Werther's original. But I had to make myself stop thinking that thought. There was research to be done, and I was going to do it. I immediately dove into all kinds of scientific books. Most kids only use the encyclopedia for their science projects, but I discovered the only, they only give very top line information. If you sleuth out specific references, the information gets better and better and you look smarter and smarter. Before I knew it, I had burned through all but three note cards. I was so lost in research that I didn't even notice mom standing right behind me. She tugged on my scarf. Hey Maggie, ready to go? I quickly made a guard with my arms so she couldn't see my notes, and I pulled every book into my backpack before she could see the titles. I gripped my note cards in my hands and kept my eyes on the door. All I had to do was make it to the car. Then the coast would be clear. Tiffany would tell me about her jeans and how a size zero is still too big on her, and I would respond with some yeti yet brilliant remark, and Mom would tell us to quit it. But as soon as I walked through the door, the book alarm sounded. The library lady, Juice Box Gibber, called me back to the desk and made me open my backpack. There it was, the M Encyclopedia. She shook her head. Now you know you can't check out reference materials. I was mortified. Yes, ma'am, I'm sorry it was an accident. Since it was my first offense, she let me off without giving me a book felony or sending me to book jail. Aha, mom said. So I know the topic starts with M, Machu Picchu, um, macaroni and cheese. I threw my scarf over my shoulder. No, mom, I'll tell you later. I didn't know when later would actually be. I thought it would be much, much later, like maybe even after I finished the report. But I just had so many little questions and one big question that couldn't wait. So later turned out to be dinner. Everyone was at the table. Mom was in her seat, cutting up dad's chicken. Dad was in his wheelchair, waiting to eat. Tiffany and Layla were putting their rolls back in the basket because they ate carbs the day before and they only ate carbs every other day. And I was pushing my carrots around my plate while dad asked Layla if she finished her English paper. Layla said she hadn't because she still wasn't sure what to write about. Dad told her to make something up because that's what he always did. Mom hit him on the leg, even though I know he couldn't feel it, and told Layla to write something from her heart. Tiffany batted her eyelashes and said, write about Bobby. He's in your heart. And then Layla threw a roll at her, and then Tiffany threw it bad, and then I blurted, is Dad gonna die? Dad dropped his fork, and not because it slipped. Layla was wide-eyed, and Tiffany kicked me under the table. Mom said what I knew she'd say. Of course not, honey. Why would you ask that? I unwrapped my scarf to let my neck breathe. I'm researching dad's disease for the science fair. I read some things at the library today. Ah, uh, I was afraid that was the M, mom said, but it was really pulling for macaroni and cheese. Dad kept his eyes on her as he pushed his chair back from the table. I thought they were going to disappear into the garage like they always did, but he stayed put. Who wants a cocktail? I want a cocktail. He pointed at mom, do you want a cocktail? Mom stood up, I would love a cocktail. I'll go fix us cocktails. Cocktails, really? I didn't want to time travel. I didn't want to hear any stories or learn any lessons or talk about old hippie stuff. I wanted to know what was happening right now. Tiffany called out to mom, I'll take a cocktail. Layla nodded, me too. I felt myself beginning to cave. I needed something to take the edge off. Sometimes on New Year's Eve, Dad let us all have a sip of his champagne while Mom wasn't looking. And then Mom would yell from the kitchen, I can see you. And then we would get the giggles, which I thought meant we were tipsy. But Tiffany said that was impossible from one sip. I raised my hand, make mine a double. Dad yelled back to Mom, honey, the girls want cocktails. Okay, two rum and cokes and three Shirley Temples coming right up. Great, a mocktail. She better give me two cherries. I needed two cherries. I let dad take a sip of his drink and then I made him give it t straight to me. Dad, are you going to die? He took another big gulp. Nope, absolutely not. I'm not going anywhere. Maybe one day when I'm a really old man, but look at me. I'm young. I still have great hair, which means I'm too good looking to die. Everyone knows good looking people don't die. Okay, fair enough. Are you going to get sicker? Mom took her seat and answered for him. Not necessarily. Your dad's really strong. Sure, we've had our setbacks, 
Well, what do we always do, Maggie? Ugh, the family motto. Now, we pull up our bootstraps, Mom nodded. Exactly. I asked if I had any more questions, and I definitely did. I wanted to talk science. How could we find a cure? What could I have invented to help? Were, was there any truth to the whole spoonful of sugar thing from Mary Poppins? Because I'd be willing to eat sugar with him if it was true, you know, for moral support. All <clears throat> this time, Layla was super quiet, which wasn't necessarily unusual when Dad and I were dropping science. But when I looked over, tears were pooling her mascara into a black puddle, and she was trying to keep it from spilling down her cheeks by staring at the ceiling. When she couldn't hold the dam any longer, she asked if she could be excused and got up from the table without waiting for an answer. What's wrong with Layla? I asked. I think she has allergies, Mom said. You know, the dogwoods are blooming. I'll take her some medicine. Mom disappeared, and then it was just Dad, Tiffany, and me at the table with all the questions. I was getting out my note cards when Tiffany asked, So what are all the pills for? Aha, maybe I wasn't the only one in the dark. Dad ran through the pharmacy. The oblong one keeps me from getting the shakes. The purple and white one keeps my spirits up. And I don't know what the red one does, but it looks like one I took out in the desert in the 70s. Jeez. I wrinkled my nose. I don't think you're supposed to tell us that kind of stuff. He laughed. I thought we were being honest. Mom came out of Layla's room, and her eyes were red now, too. She took her, sip, her seat and sipped from her mostly empty glass. Is there anything else you want to know, Maggie? She looked at me with the same look on her face that she had when she broke the news to me about the Easter Bunny. Someone better do something with all the, oh, just like Santa, highly suspicious. I hid my note cards. No, ma'am. Well, that's all we know, Maggie. That's all anyone knows. I turned to Dad. Are you scared? He shook his head and puffed up his chest. Never. I believed him. Then I remembered I had one more question. Should I be going to church? I knew God wasn't a doctor, and we never learned about him in science class, but maybe we should be covering all our bases. Should we be praying for a miracle? Dad asked Mom for more ice, and she disappeared again into the kitchen. I think God's got his hands full right now, Maggie, which was true. All that stuff about the rainforest alone must be keeping him pretty busy. But I wouldn't let it go. Maybe we should start going again. Why did we stop? Mom returned with Dad's drink, which was full, but not with ice. He took a sip. It's just too crowded. That made sense. Everyone in church was praying for their own miracles, which didn't leave any room for ours. Their prayers were crowding the path to heaven. If we went to church, our prayers would have circled for hours before ever landing. Our prayers needed a lot of room to be heard. We needed to be praying in open fields or in the backyard or at very least in our rooms at night. Do you pray, Dad? Dad looked at me every night. That night, I'm pretty sure we all prayed. I hadn't prayed in a while because honestly, I had everything I ever wanted. Good books, good hair, great grades. But that night I prayed with all my might. I asked God to save Dad, to cure him, and please, for the love of himself, do something about the dogwoods. The next morning, Mom and Dad didn't pick me, didn't make me pick a new topic, but they did make me promise to ask questions along the way and let them read the report before I turned it in. We shook on it, and I got back to work. A couple of, after a couple days, I was positive I had the winning project again. For my big ta-da piece, I drew a picture of dad and diagrammed where everything was happening. I drew arrows where the sleepiness was pulling him this way and that. Then with his help, I also put in some cool dude stuff. The arrow next to his eyes said, sometimes his eyes are blurry, but they will never forget the sight of Jimi Hendrix playing the Star Spangled Banner on his electric guitar, which these eyeballs saw in 1969. The arrow next to his brain said, sometimes his brain does a lot of tricky things, but it will never forget a single word of Stairway to Heaven. We finished with a bunch of bunch more arrows and facts. I turned my project in and eagerly waited three days for an A. But on day three, when I got my project back, it was a B. I was devastated. A B! One catch to the science fair was that only A's could be entered, ensuring that only the very best projects competed for the top prize. Getting a B kept me from entering at all. I scrambled to the last page of my report 
and read Mrs. Hainberry's exp explanation. While I love the personal touches throughout the paper and the extensive research, science fair rules state that you have to propose a solution to your topic's problem. And Maggie, you presented no solution. Next year, pick a problem you can solve. Seriously, lady, read the report. There's no cure. What did she want from me? Even scientists couldn't solve this problem. I stayed after class to challenge the grade, but Mrs. Hainby wouldn't budge. She insisted she couldn't bend the science fair rules. My blue ribbon dreams were no more. I went home and told dad, and he was so mad he asked me to put him in the car and drive him down to school. I can't drive dad, I can barely ride a bike. Fine, he said, and he waited for mom to get home so she could drive him down there where he could raise H-E double hockey sticks. At first I had to fight in me, but then I had to concede because Mrs. Hainberry was right. I don't think there's anything she can do, Dad. Dad wheeled close to me. But you worked so hard. We both did. I've never worked so hard on a school project in my life. But I didn't follow the rules. I didn't solve any problems. Well, if that's how you feel, then okay. But I still think you deserve to win. I didn't agree with him. The winner was supposed to have a clear solution. All I had were more questions. The only thing I had confirmed was sometimes you end up learning things you wish you hadn't, and you can't unlearn them. I couldn't unknow that there was no cure. That was There was no fixing dad. I couldn't unthink that more scary stuff was going to happen. I couldn't unwonder if the worst was yet to come. I could just hope he was right about one thing. Good looking people don't die. Chapter 14. Getting a B on a science fair project really wrecked me. Not only because B's were for losers, but because some idiot went on to win my blue ribbon. Jeremy Smith did some boring report on windmills and how they would solve the energy crisis. Yeah, right. The only thing that was going to solve an energy crisis was math and a lot of it. The worst part? He didn't even have a ta-da moment. He just made a lame three-panel board covered in a bunch of pictures. I just didn't know what those judges were thinking. Didn't anyone have standards anymore? You think Albert Einstein ever made a three-panel board? Of course not. He had awesome hair, and people with awesome hair only did awesome things, just like Dad and me. Not only did that terrible B put me in a funk, it put my GPA in a funk, too. I needed to do some major studying and major extra credit to get it back up to my perfect 4.0. Luckily, spring break was coming up, so I had a whole seven days to independently study until my eyeballs fell, eyeballs fell out. I asked Mrs. Hainberry if there was anything I could do to get my science grade back on track. She said she'd give me bonus points on the final exam if I grew mold on bread and brought it in for our lesson on penicillin. I gladly accepted the challenge. When I got home from school on Friday, I commandeered all the bread in the kitchen. I stashed two loaves under my bed because mold grows in dark places, which I already knew, though I hadn't studied it yet. I pushed both loaves to the farthest, darkest corner but then I realized it was probably going to smell really bad in a couple days, so I pulled them back out and put them under Tiffany's bed instead. What? She would have done the same thing to me. And you know what? It totally worked. After a week, my GPA shot back up with the help of the moldiest bread ever. The downside? Tiffany gave me the silent treatment for over a week after she found it growing under her bed. Not that I cared, since she never really said anything of interest to me anyway. Did I care about the dance team? No. Did I care about who she was dating? No. Did I care she got caught sneaking out of the house twice in one week? Sort of, but mostly no. And trust me, the silent treatment was worth it because my grades were better than ever and nothing could have bring them down again, except for one thing. Well, it's hard to admit there was one subject at school I didn't dominate, gym class. It just wasn't my thing. And usually my gym teachers let me get away with not doing too much. And lately it had been especially easy because my teacher was going to have a baby and as she got bigger and bigger, we did less and less. One day she even let us read and said we were exercising our eyeballs, which I loved. I probably burned 4,000 eyeball calories that day. She wasn't even due until June, which meant it was smooth sailing until the end of the year. That was until she went into labor early and life as I knew it was over. After my gym teacher went on maternity leave, my class joined Coach Eastbrook's class. Coach Eastbrook was the track coach, and he ran everywhere, 
including to school. I'm serious. He ran to school every day, and every day my bus passed him, and every day I thought, this guy is nuts. Even more nuts? He made his students run an entire mile every day. I couldn't even walk for two minutes without getting winded. There was no way I was going to deal with this, so I did what any rational human being do. I lied. At dinner the night during my first day in his class, I told Mom I wasn't feeling well. She felt my forehead and said I wasn't warm, but I swore I was getting sick, and that was probably really serious. To convince her I did something I never did, I skipped dessert. When she got out the ice cream, I politely declined. I don't want any. Really? Geez, don't act so surprised. I just don't feel like it. But you never say no to ice cream. Is everything okay? I don't feel good. It's probably the flu or mono or the plague. Well, let's get you to bed. Hopefully you'll feel better in the morning. She bought it. I climbed into bed, which was exactly where I wanted to be. I had hidden a few, seven, chips of Hoy cookies under my pillow earlier in preparation for skipping dessert. When I woke up the next morning, Mom had left a note saying I could stay home if I still wasn't feeling well. But I couldn't stay home because I had a feeling there was going to be a pop quiz in science, and my pop quiz intuition was never wrong. So I figured I'd go to school, ace the quiz, and then check out right before sixth period gym. It was the perfect plan. And aha, there was a pop quiz, and I aced it. In between classes, I called mom, but she didn't answer because she's always too busy to answer her phone at work, even though I was her daughter and needed her more than anyone else, especially at that very moment. So I called dad. It was deep into double jeopardy. I could tell because of how he answered the phone. Where's Barut? Hey, dad, I don't feel good. Can I check out of school? Where is Beijing? Dad, listen, I need to check out of school. Quick, Maddie. Name other Maggie. Name other B cities. Boise, Belfast, Bangalore. He finally paid attention. Those are good. What's up? I need to come home. I am really sick. Oh, Mags, I'm sorry. Yes, I was home free. But I don't think mom can come get you. Sure, you can't tough it out. You only have a couple hours left. I have to come home now, I insisted. I'm too sick to go to gym class. Well, how about I call your teacher and tell him to let you sit it out until you're feeling better? Whew. I gave him the school number, thanked him, and gave him Berlin for final jeopardy. I was all smiles as I changed in the bathroom stall with the door locked. My gym clothes were already underneath my school clothes, so it didn't take long. And I didn't even put on socks, because who needs socks to read? Not me. I found my favorite spot on the bleachers, opened my book to the bookmark, and dug into a midsummer's night dream. I was in the thick of Act 2 when Coach Eastbrook jogged over. Hey, Maggie, why aren't you in formation with the troops? What was this, boot camp? Didn't you talk to my dad? I'm too sick to run today. Yes, I did, and we agreed a good run is exactly what you need. Do you know endorphins have healing powers? I counted on dodging this draft just like Dad. I can't run. I'll die. In 20 years of teaching, no one has ever died on me. Come on, he said with a wave. How is this happening? He led me to the gym door and out onto the track where the rest of the class was stretching. I put the air brakes on my heels. I can't, coach. I conscientiously object. He reached for my hand, which I was pretty sure was illegal. A mile is just four laps, Maggie. Four laps? I couldn't run four laps. And then he let out an ungodly whistle. And then everyone took off running, including me. Because when you see a group of people running, you run too. It's an evolutionary response. Every step was instantly excruciating, and not just because my lungs were about to explode, but also because I wasn't wearing any socks. In a few minutes, I was sure paramedics would be carrying me off the field, and they'd be horrified to find my heels completely rubbed raw. I'd live the rest of my life without heels, which meant I would have to tiptoe everywhere, which meant people would think I was reaching for something even when I wasn't. Until the day I died, I'd live as if every single thing was just out of my reach. I could feel the speed of other kids lapping me once, twice, three times. A whole gaggle of boys finished all four laps before I was halfway through one. I stared at my feet, willing them to go faster, but all they could muster was a chug, a very slow chug. 
I was just about to give up completely when Mary Winter came jogging across the center of the track toward me. Great, just what I needed during my darkest half hour. I couldn't believe how perfect she looked. She had just run a mile and she looked like she was going to prom. Perfect hair, perfect ponytail, perfect smile, smiling perfectly. She ran up next to me and then the weirdest thing ever happened. She tried to help me. Hey, Maggie, she said perfectly. You don't look so good. I was so out of breath, my brain couldn't pull together a comeback or an insult or even a fact about how I was probably going to die. She jogged in place next to me, which was strange because I thought I was actually making progress, but she was moving faster than me and she wasn't going anywhere. She reached back and adjusted her ponytail. I talked to coach and he said I could give you a few pointers. I tried to run away, but well, I couldn't. I tried ignoring her, but she kept jibber jabbering. You're running all hunched over. It's wasting a lot of energy. You need to push your shoulders back. Pretend there's a triangle in your lower back pulling you up. She pulled my shoulders back and I almost jumped out of my skin. My fight or flight reflexes kicked into flight, but my legs wouldn't let me, so I fought with words instead. I know how to run, every species does. Oh, well, it will be a lot easier if you suck in your diaphragm and breathe through your nose. That's what my dad says anyway, he runs all the time. I was trapped. So what I did, I did what any animal would have done if it was backed up against a wall. I sucked in my diaphragm and breathed through my nose. Her pointers helped for about five whole seconds. And then I couldn't run anymore, so I yelled, I can't run anymore. Don't stop, if you stop, you'll never start again. I slowed to a snail's pace, I can't do it anymore. She ran in front of me, turned around and locked eyes with me still running. You can do it, Maggie. I know you can. You just need to stop focusing on the pain. My thoughts raced 10,000 times faster than my feet. What was this girl talking about? How did she know I could keep going? Why was her ponytail so perfect? Seriously, not a hair out of place. Come on, match your pace with mine and we'll be done in no time. Was this girl joking? I wanted to stop, not run faster. I tried to imagine there was a piping hot glazed donut waiting for me at the finish line, but then I immediately got a cramp in my side. Mary was still jogging backward ahead of me. Ahead of me, it hurts, I'm stopping. Don't stop, quick, what's your favorite song? What? Who could ask a question like that at a time like this? Is it the slumber party? What was next? Braiding each other's hair? Freezing her underpants? My brain was a blur of confusion and pain. The song about the states. I gasped. I don't think I know that song. Yes, you do. The song in fourth grade, Memorial Day, spectacular. Oh, ha, that one, really? I don't think I remember it. I couldn't breathe, let alone sing, but Mary sang, and she sang totally off key, which kind of made me happy. 50 nifty United States from 13 original colonies. Come on, sing with me. Helpless, I joined in. Shout them, scout them. Tell them all about them, one by one, till we've given a day to every state in the U.S.A. We were on our 10,000th verse when we finally finished lap four. All the other kids had already gone back to the locker room and were probably dressed in home and watching television with their fathers who hadn't betrayed them. Coach Eastbrook clicked his stopwatch and yelled, 29 minutes and 32 seconds. See, Maggie, you didn't die. I collapsed in the grass. Not yet. Mary sat down next to me. She reached her hands all the way down to her toes because obviously she didn't have bones. I rolled my head over in the grass. You didn't have to do that. She reperfected her ponytail. I know I wanted to. Then she popped up and started jogging in place again. And don't thank me yet. We have a lot more miles before the end of the semester. And then she was gone like a perfect phantom who wore pear-scented body lotion. I couldn't believe it. I ran a mile without dying. Even more amazing, why did Mary Winter care if I lived or died? At dinner, I iced my knee because that's what real athletes do. Water dripped on the carpet and mom yelled, Maggie, what are you doing? I pressed another cube of ice to my other knee. I'm icing my knees. I ran a mile today. You're supposed to put ice in a bag, duh. Tiffany sighed, you're such a dork. I was just about to throw the half-melted ice cube at her when mom interrupted. 
You ran a whole mile today? I thought you didn't feel good. Well, my throat is still sore. I coughed a little, but I pushed through it. Like father, like daughter, Dad said. What was your time? 29 minutes, give or take nine minutes. Tiffany laughed. Slugs run faster than that. I'd had enough of her, so I ran. Yes, I run now. To my room and slammed the door much harder than a slug ever could. For some reason, she followed me. Get out of my room, I yelled. This is my room, too, she yelled back. Why are you such a jerk? Why are you such a dork? Calm down. I threw my pillow and it just missed her head. It wasn't an accident. It was a warning shot. Hey, it's not my fault you're such a disgrace to our entire family. I threw another pillow and didn't miss. Oh, like you are every Friday night. She lunged at me. I lunged at her. Mom rushed in and pulled us apart. What is going on in here? We both pointed at each other. She started it, we yelled at the same time. Dad rolled into the room, or he rolled in as far as he could without rolling into the sea of dirty clothes. I don't care who did what or who told on to. All I'm going to say is, Maggie, I cannot believe you ran a mile. <clears throat> Mom hit him on the arm to remind him we were in trouble. Dad left. I'm serious. I've never even seen her walk fast. You're one to talk, I said under my breath. Mom gave me a look. Hey, what's the house rule? You're the only one allowed to make fun of Dad, I recited. Mom crossed her arms. And don't you forget it. Can I go now? Tiffany huffed. No. Mom wheeled Dad away and turned around. No one is leaving until someone says she's sorry. And then she shut the door. I crawled into bed and mummified myself in a blanket. Tiffany came over and shoved me. I didn't move a muscle. She shoved me again. Just apologize so we can leave. I ripped the blanket off. Apologize to you? You're the one ruining my life. Whatever. I don't even believe you ran that far anyway. Well, you can talk to ask Mary Winter because she ran with me. Mary Winter? Bode's sister? Isn't she, like, popular? Yeah, so what? So why would she talk to you? I don't know. Why does her brother swap spit with you? Hey, that's none of your business. Then stop making it my business. She stormed out of the room and I yelled after her. Apology accepted. Two days later in gym class, I secured three layers of band-aids on my heels and carefully positioned my socks. And then I put on another pair of socks just in case. I walked out of the locker room, through the gym and onto the track certain I was going to have to go it alone today. No way Mary Winter would want to help me two classes in a row, but she did. Hey Maggie, what are we singing today? I shook my head. It's okay, you don't have to run with me anymore. She leaned down to tighten her shoes. Why not? I leaned down <clears throat> and tightened my laces too because it looked professional. And I thought, since I was down here, I might as well pull up my bootstraps too. Because this is my fight, Mary, not yours. I patted her on the shoulder, saluted, and took my place on the track. I had to prove to myself that I could do it. I gazed around the track and visualized it as a scranton that I was about to fill in with every right answer. My feet would be my number two pencil. I reached for my toes one last time, and then another pair of feet joined me, and they belonged to Mary Winter. Hey, I get it if you don't want to run together, but maybe after class you can talk me through our science homework. I'm lost. My mind wanted to tell her to go away, but my feet, legs, and spleen, whatever spleen is, remembered the pain of trying to run by myself. Maybe it was okay to need someone's help, just this once. I scooted over and made room for her next to me on the track. We can talk about it while we run. I have it memorized. So we ran, and we sang, and I almost died once, and then I recovered, and then I dropped some knowledge about mitochondria, and then I almost threw up, and then I got a cramp. And then I remembered the triangle on my lower back, and then we only had three more laps to go. And then I realized that maybe Mary Winter wasn't out to get me. Maybe she wasn't even being mean with the flower back in February. Maybe she wasn't trying to ruin my life. Maybe she was just nice. Maybe it was okay if Clyde liked her, just as long as she never liked him back. Maybe we were friends. Chapter 15 
I must have gained a lot of muscle from running, because I no longer needed Mom's help getting a Nutella jar open, which meant I got Nutella without her permission, which meant my life was complete. And I felt better than ever when school ended. I got all A's again, and I won every award at awards night again. I kept my chin and bootstraps up as I signed Mary's yearbook at the yearbook signing party after study hall. She blocked off a little corner just for me, and I wrote extra small so I could fit in all my well wishes for her over the summer. I wrote how lucky it was that she got to go to summer school. I tried to get into summer school with Mary, but my advisor says it's for kids who are behind, not ahead. They're lost. <clears throat> and how double lucky it was that we became friends in gym class, and I hoped we would have a class together again next year. But maybe not gym. Maybe something super fun like Latin or geometry. And I promised to keep running, or at the very least take up speed walking like the old ladies in the mall, with cool hats and even cooler fanny packs. I was just dotting my last eye when another yearbook slid across the table next to me. I looked up, and there he was, Clyde. Hey, Maggie, want to sign my yearbook? I almost choked and I wasn't even chewing anything, which was unusual. I was nervous, but I pulled it together. Um, yeah, sure. I opened his yearbook, and it was covered in like a zillion signatures, mostly from girls. I couldn't find an empty spot anywhere. He seemed to have gotten really popular, especially with the ladies. Where should I sign? Hmm. He scratched the back of his head like some kind of rock star philosopher. How about next to your picture? I turned to the page where my picture should have been. Oh! I don't have one this year, see? Were you sick on picture day or something? No, I wanted to wear a tricorn hat like George Washington, and they wouldn't photograph me wearing it, so I refused to have my picture taken at all. <laughs> really? Clyde laughed. That's pretty cool, standing up for what you believe in and everything. Well, I was sitting, but thanks. I found an empty space on the second to last page. How about right here? Perfect. Want me to sign yours? I couldn't believe it. He wanted to sign my yearbook. I tried to keep my hand from shaking as I passed it to him. He opened it and was immediately impressed. Wow, there are lots of signatures in here. From teachers. I tried to be modest. Yeah, they really like me. He started writing and my brain blanked. What should I write? Should I tell him to keep in touch? No, you can't keep in touch if you're not in touch in the first place. Should I profess my love for him? in a no-holds-barred essay referencing my extensive research about how we were meant to be? Maybe not. What did, would Dad tell me to write? He would tell me to say something cool, so I did just that. Dear Clyde, have a perfect summer. I'll see you next year close to the harvest moon. Get it? Like Neil Young's harvest moon? I hope you got it. I'm sure you did. You get everything. And if you need any book recommendations for over the summer, I have about a thousand. Sincerely, love, God, I wanted to write love, Maggie. I handed the yearbook back to him and he handed mine back to me. And away he went, off with the metaphorical summer sunset. I wasn't by his side, but I hoped I was in his heart. As soon as he disappeared around the corner, I searched for the page he signed in my yearbook. I couldn't find his signature anywhere. I went page by page and finally found it where I least expected it on the same page in the same square where my picture was supposed to be. Clyde had sketched a portrait of me, and I was wearing a tricorn hat, just like George Washington's. Next, he had written, Stay cool, Maggie Mayfield. Peace, Clyde. I pressed the book close, hoping his words would transfer by osmosis directly into my heart. He thought I was cool. The final bell of the school year rang, and I realized I had never been happier. I decided I would keep up with my running over the summer. Well, for a couple weeks anyway. I ran up and down our neighborhood and saw things I'd never seen before because I'd really only been up our street in a car. The farthest I'd ever walked was to the mailbox and that was only a month, once a month when National Geographic arrived. It turned out there was a whole world out there of other families doing other things. I passed one house with a dad playing basketball with his son and I wondered if Dad's legs were awake and if he were a boy, if I were a boy, would we be doing the same thing? Probably not. I bet even if I was a boy, I'd be too smart for sports. I'd always stopped in front of the house at the top of the hill when I was on an evening run. I'd peer into the window where the mom was always in the kitchen doing dishes or making dinner or cleaning something. And I'd remember when my mom was always doing something in our kitchen window 
And it seemed like forever ago, before she was a puddle of clothes, before I had to share her with all those hotel guests. So much had changed since the summer before, and not just my calves, although they were significantly shapelier. I even hung out with Layla and Tiffany, and not against my will. While they lathered up SPF Zero and lay out on the towels in the driveway, I joined them. Well, I joined them from the safety of the shade I'd created with three umbrellas and an old tarp from the garage. I didn't want to damage my fair skin. Dad always said I would have been adored in the Victorian era, which I like to think about because I always felt like I belonged to every era except the one I was born into. I especially felt a connection to eras where they wore layers and layers of underpants and read books by candlelights while enjoying madelines and drinking tea. It was shaping up to be a perfect summer until one day when it took a sudden and particular turn. I was partaking in some light summer reading of Leaves of Grass while Layla and Tiffany read Seventeen magazines in their usual sunning spot. All was quiet on the home front. Even Dad was outside with us catching some rays while reading Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance for the millionth time. But the quiet was broken when Mom's car zoomed up the driveway. She slammed on the brakes and just stopped short of pancaking Layla and Tiffany. They jumped up in terror. Dad yelled some bad words and Mom freaked. What are you doing lying in the middle of the driveway? She screamed out the window. Us, Tiffany yelled. What are you doing going 90 up the driveway in the middle of the afternoon? Everyone calm down, Dad commanded. And then he laughed. And let's remember it was your mother who almost killed you, not me. That's enough. I'm really sorry, she said. I should have called first to tell you I was coming home early. But I have good news. Phyllis and Donnie are coming to visit. Oh, dear. Phyllis and Donnie were Mom and Dad's hippie burnout friends from way back. They used to visit when I was little, whenever they were on their hippie motorcycle trips to hippie places across the country. But we hadn't seen them in a while. I assumed they'd been kidnapped or had turned to a life of crime. This was exactly what my perfect summer didn't need, a night of swapping anti-war stories with a bunch of degenerates. Mom rushed us all inside. Time to clean up. They'll be here tomorrow. Tomorrow, I asked. That didn't seem like enough time to hide the valuables. What's the rush? Well, it's your dad's and my wedding anniversary. What better way to celebrate than with friends? Plus, we need witnesses. Witnesses to what? Are you planning a bank heist? Dad laughed, which I thought was the wrong reaction for someone being accused of a felony. Your mother and I are going to renew our wedding vows right here. What's that mean? Mom smiled. It means there's going to be a wedding. The next morning, I heard a loud rumble from the window. Two homeless-looking people were parking their motorcycles in our driveway. Dad joined me at the window and waved at them. Don't wave at them, I yelped. For all we know, they could be murderers. I'm afraid we have to let these murderers inside. I leaned forward. They looked like they had done hard, they had done time. Hard time. I had to get Tiffany. If anyone knew how to chase off bad people, it was Tiffany. She chased me away all the time, and I was a good person. I ran to our room and flung open the curtains. Look outside, I hissed at Tiffany, who was still prone on her bed. Are these the scariest looking people you've ever seen? No, you're the scariest looking person I've ever seen, she said without looking up. Layla must have heard the panic in my voice because she came to see what was up. Do you think they're going to kill us in our sleep? I asked. No, but they are creepier than I remember. They even have skeletons on their shirts. What's creepier than that? That made me wonder where else they were keeping skeletons. Layla looked worried. God, I hope they don't come to my wedding one day. She had a point. Geez, I hope they don't come to mine either. Tiffany was awake now. No one is coming to your Maggie, Matt, to your wedding, Maggie, not even the groom. She was the worst, but I didn't have time to deal with her. I ran to the living room. Hey, parents, we have a consensus. These people are terrifying, and we don't really think you should let them in. There was a knock at the door. <laughs> Too late, Mom laughed. I can't die. I'm going to bring president of the United States of America. Dad shushed me while Mom opened the door. Phyllis was the first one in. Hey, y'all. As her skull shirt moved closer, I started to lose it. We were all going to die. I'd never be president. Forget the United States. 
I'd never be president of my class. And I had a really good platform for the next election too. Free pizza Fridays. But I'd never get to rally for it because I'd be dead with no free pizza for anyone ever again. Phyllis hugged mom so hard I thought mom's arms might pop off. I've missed you so much, her scratchy voice kept repeating. When she finally released mom, I got a good look at her. The first thing I noticed was the mood ring she wore as a wedding band. It was bright red, which meant she was happy, excited, anxious, and or in love. The next thing I noticed was her long, wavy red hair, followed by her blue jeans that belled at the bottom. And then I noticed the skeletons on her shirt again. And then I noticed they were heading straight for me, and then I took a deep breath. My feet left the ground as she pulled me into the skull on her chest, which I assumed wasn't the last skull I would see that day. Oh my God, you look just like your daddy. I know, lady, keep reminding me. My feet, feet thumped back to the ground, and Phyllis moved on to her next victims, Layla and Tiffany. Look at these beauties. Y'all look like your mother. Such little knockout. Dad wheeled over next to Phyllis. She's still a knockout. Phyllis's mood ring faded to green, which meant she was uneasy, restless, scared. I wondered why she felt any of those things. Maybe she didn't recognize Dad without long hair. Maybe she was scared the police had bugged him with a wiretap. Maybe she'd never seen a wheelchair with an I'm proud of my honor roll student bumper sticker stuck to the back of the seat. I put this bumper sticker on Dad's wheelchair. He doesn't know it's there. She took a deep breath and tears welled in her eyes, turning her blue mascara into an ocean. Is that my Danny? Dad wheeled closer and pinched her tush. Yep, that's my Danny, she yelped. What do you say? Are you ready to get hitched again? Donnie came in next, and he didn't say much, but he high-fived all of us, which was totally weird. He put their bags on the floor, and they immediately made our whole house smell like the Renaissance Festival. I snooped around their stuff and took in every detail just in case I needed to explain anything to the police. Danny set a banjo against the wall, and Phyllis pulled something wrapped in a scarf out of her bag. It might have been a gun, so I closed my eyes and mentally prepared for the end. But nothing happened, and when I opened my eyes, she was holding out a giant egg with a painting on it. This is for your daddy. He always wanted me to paint him a wolf howling at the moon. Did you make this? I sure did. It's one of my babies. <clears throat> I mumbled, cool. But I nervously wondered if this woman laid eggs. Sure, scientifically, physically, and anatomically, it wasn't possible, but you never knew, especially with this weirdo. I would have asked Dad, but he probably wouldn't have told me for another 10 years. Downey fixed the grown-ups' Coca-Colas with more than Coca-Cola in them. Dad told us to clean up outside for the ceremony, so Layla, Tiffany, and I wandered into the backyard. I still didn't really get what was happening. I mean, they were already married. They didn't need to get married again. That's like taking a test twice, although I wasn't opposed to taking tests twice. I picked up some sticks and pine cones and threw them over the fence. I'd forgotten how big our backyard was. Great, even more places to hide a body. I pulled a few weeds and then I heard everyone come outside. Dad was looking at Donnie's motorcycle all wide-eyed. What do you say, Danny? Donnie asked with a nudge. How about a ride? Tiffany's extra bad side kicked in. Yeah, Dad, do it. Saddle me up. Dad shouted. I was clearly the only sane person in the family. No way, I protested. You could crash and break a femur, tibula, fibula, or patella, or any of the other 206 bones. Let's just make sure my face is okay. I like my face. Dad winked at me. Donnie handed him a helmet and laughed and laughed. In that case, you'll be needing this. I really didn't want him to go. I grabbed Mom's hand in solidarity, but she dropped it so she could position Dad's chair right behind the handlebars. The whole thing was terrifying, so I tried to hold Tiffany's hand out of desperation, but she shook her hand away because she's the meanest girl alive. And then out of nowhere, Phyllis grabbed my hand and held it tightly, and for the first time all day, I didn't feel like I was going to get murdered. Mom counted to three and hoisted Dad up onto the motorcycle seat. He pulled his sleeping legs on either side of the motorcycle and wrapped his arms around Donnie's waist. 
Phyllis let go of my hand and wound bungee cords around Dad and Donnie until there were one body with four arms and two heads. And then Donnie stepped on a pedal and then a big engine roared and then Dad yelled some curse words and Mom shouted, bring them back in one piece, please. We're getting married tomorrow. Dad threw a peace sign as they took off down the road toward God only knows where. While they were gone, I beat Layla at Uno, Phyllis French braided Tiffany's hair, and Mom held her breath, staring out the window. Finally, a headlight bounced off the wall. We ran outside and watched Dad, Donnie, and the motorcycle purr into the driveway. As soon as Dad was unbungeed from Donnie, he collapsed into Mom's arms. She had to set him up in his chair because he was all dangly like a rag doll. I don't know where they'd gone, but Dad smelled like trees and sweat and fireflies and rock and roll if rock and roll had a smell. He lifted up his shirt. See how tough these marks from the bungee cords make me look? Phyllis cranked up the stereo, so he had to yell over the music. Oh, man, does it hurt? But Dad didn't hear me. All anyone could hear was some lady screaming something about buying her a Mercedes Benz. We ate dinner, and Mom rushed us off to bed without dessert, which wasn't cool, because dessert was the only reason I ate dinner. Tiffany and I got into our beds while Layla slid into the sleeping bag on the floor, and Mom quickly wished us good night, turned off the lights, and shut the door. Geez, she could have at least pretended like she cared about us. The next morning, the most amazing smell in all the land woke up my nose and carried my whole body into the kitchen. Could it be? Certainly it wasn't peach pie baking. Not so early, but I peered into the oven and sure enough it was there. The most perfect peach pie bubbling over. Smells amazing, right? Yes! I answered without breaking my gaze with the perfect pie. I think she's about ready. Let's get her out. It was only then that I realized I'd been talking to Phyllis, not Mom. She must have been making it for the wedding. Defeat settled on my shoulders. It looks amazing. It will be hard to wait for it. Don't be silly, little one. This is for breakfast. Pie for breakfast? Maybe she wasn't a murderer. Maybe she was the most amazing woman ever. Phyllis grabbed a pot holder and opened the oven door. My nose followed the pie all the way to the counter. Can we eat it right now? Let's wait a little for it to cool. I'll get the ice cream. Pie and ice cream for breakfast? I ran down the hall and woke up my sisters. Eyes open, ladies. We're having pie and ice cream for breakfast. They moaned and groaned and didn't move an inch. Whatever their loss. I knocked on mom and dad's door. Parents, wake up, that's pie for breakfast. I didn't hear a peep. What is wrong with these people? I had the human decency to share probably the greatest news we were ever gonna get as a family, and they couldn't have cared less. But I didn't have time to dwell on their nonsense. I had pie to eat for breakfast. I was already on my second slice when the Mayfield family finally joined my new best friends, Phyllis and Donnie at the table. Dad looked like he'd been hit by a truck, and he smelled weird. So I said, you smell weird. Well, you look weird. Hey, you're not allowed to say stuff like that. You're my dad. He clutched his forehead. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just have the worst headache. Mom handed in some aspirin and a slice of pie. This should help. I see you've made a couple friends, Maggie. Oh, we're big fans, Phyllis smiled. She already lobbied me for my vote and everything. Donnie said. It's important to get to know your constituents, I explained. Mom took a piece of pie too, which was very unmom like Well, I expect to see all of you on the dance floor later. I still didn't get it. Why do you have to renew your wedding vows anyway? Do they expire? No, no, it's just a nice thing to do, Mom said. It's a nice way of reminding your mother she's stuck with me, Dad added, forever. Mom disappeared down the hall and came back with two fancy dresses I'd never seen before. Here you go, she told Layla and Tiffany. You're going to be my bridesmaids. They oohed and aahed and disappeared into the bathroom to try them on. Dad wheeled next to me and handed me a bow tie. And you're going to be my best man, Maggie. I am not a boy, 
First you say I look weird, and then you think I'm a boy? What is wrong with you people? Sorry, sorry. I didn't mean best man. I meant best daughter. Will you be my best daughter? I hate bows, you know, I said grudgingly as I grudgingly took the tie. What's wrong with bows? Mom answered before I could. Everything. Exactly. The wedding wasn't a big to-do or anything. We weren't even going to a church. We stayed at our house. Dad had hired someone to come do the ceremony. I thought that would mean a priest, but Dad had hired an Elvis impersonator who just happened to be an ordained minister. Layla, Tiffany, and Mom were taking forever in the bathroom getting ready, and Phyllis and Donnie had borrowed the car to pick up the cake at the bakery. So Dad and I watched the news while we waited in our ties. I shook my head. Can you believe this oil crisis? Are you sure you're only 11? I know, I can't believe it either. Layla and Tiffany emerged from the bathroom in their fancy new dresses humming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, here comes the bride. And mom emerged with a big ta-da in the most beautiful white dress with her most beautiful red hair swept around her most beautiful freckled face. Dad whistled and I ran to hug her. You look like frosting. Thank you, I think, Mom laughed. Tiffany pried me away. Don't lick her. Phyllis and Donnie arrived with the cake at the same time as a pink Cadillac pulled into the driveway. It was my duty as best daughter to escort pretend Elvis to the backyard where he was to marry Mom and Dad under a big oak tree we decorated with crepe paper bells. Then I took my place next to Dad with Mom and Dad's rings which were still warm from their hands. When Elvis pushed play on the boombox, Layla walked down the aisle, followed by Tiffany, and then Mom appeared, escorted by Phyllis and Donnie. We all gathered around them, and Dad grabbed Mom's hand, and Mom leaned over and kissed him, even though you're not supposed to do that until the pretend Elvis pronounces you man and wife. But I guess it was okay, since they were already man and wife. Then Elvis, the pretend Elvis began, Do you take this man to be your husband, for better or worse, richer or, for, or poorer, in sickness and in health? And do you promise to make him your only hunk of hunk of burning love forever? Mom laughed. I do. Pretend Elvis kneeled next to Dad's chair. Do you take this woman to be your wife, for better or worse, richer or poorer, in sickness and in health? And do you promise to make her your earth angel from here to eternity? Of course, Dad's voice cracked. He was taking this very seriously. I do. I gave them their rings, and then some other stuff happened that included more kissing, and then there was cake from my favorite bakery. The cake had a tiny man and woman on top that you couldn't eat, which I knew because I tried and almost lost a tooth. But I recovered and ate more cake while Layla and Tiffany talked about their weddings and how they would be huge and spectacular and rich, and I could see Dad doing math in his head. I was carefully constructing the perfect bite of cake that was 90% frosting and 10% cake when I asked, was your first wedding as cool as this one? Mom took the rest of the cake away because she knew when to cut me off. Our first wedding was great. Your father wore a white tux and platform shoes because he is ridiculous, and a friend made my dress, and we danced to Gladys Knight and Eric Clapton, and then your father's friends wrote, wrote something in shaving cream on our car that they shouldn't have. I scraped the last microscopic piece of frosting from my plate. What did they write? Dad shook the ice in his glass and opened his mouth, but I interrupted. I know, I know, you'll tell me in 10 years. Layla pushed the rest of her cake toward me. What do you remember, Dad? Dad took the last sip from his glass and time traveled. I remember your mom looking like a knockout, just beautiful. And I remember a lot of dancing and shaking, a lot of hands and smiling so hard my face hurt. And I remember the punch. And then I don't remember much after the punch. I turned to Phyllis and Donnie. What do you guys remember? Phyllis laughed. Not much more than your dad. Donnie added, we had the punch too. Well. I'll always remember this wedding, I vowed, and this cake. Oh, well, it's not over yet, sweetie. Don't you know what happens next? Mom asked. 
More cake? I hoped. Even better, Mom beamed. A honeymoon.